Uh, hello, everybody. A very warm welcome uh, to CSDS this afternoon. Gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, our friend, Dr. Rahul Ranjan, uh, who is probably one of the best examples of the kind of transdisciplinary intellectual that we need for our times. Uh, trained in political studies initially, Rahul went on to do uh, his uh, PhD in anthropology and then moved on to uh, working in the fields of law as well as environment. Uh, Rahul at this moment is uh, located in Norway as a postdoctoral environmental scholar at Oslo Metropolitan University uh, in a very, very large multi-country project on riverine rights, the currents and consequences of legal innovations on the rights of rivers. So as is obvious by the name, this project uh, looks at the question of whether rivers can be ascribed legal personhood and what that entails uh, for the idea of rights involving both humans and non-humans. Um, earlier, uh, uh, last year actually, he uh, had edited a book that some of you might have already seen from Routledge called At the Crossroads of Rights, Forest Struggles and Human Rights in Post-Colonial India. And his very, very new Off the Oven book, uh, which you also see outside displayed, is called The Political Life of Memory, Birsa Munda in Contemporary India, a very beautifully produced book with uh, a cover whose artwork was specially commissioned by Rahul from one of his uh, friends uh, in the field, uh, uh, an Adivasi painter called Lakhinder Hasa. And I've requested Rahul to also tell us more about the making of his relationships, which came comes out in the book so beautifully. Uh, Rahul, it's a huge pleasure. Thank you very much for coming and speaking to us. Uh, say about 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll have some Q&A. Yeah, Rahul. Um, I must begin by thanking uh, Professor Banerjee for accepting my request to let me speak at CSDS, which is a place that I frequented not many years ago as a student uh, from both North Campus and, and JNU. So it's great pleasure and deeply uh, intimidating to be back as a speaker, not as a student. Um, but I look forward to hearing what you think of the presentation and what you think of the book, if you may have read. Um, so uh, what I thought I would do today since some of you are already reading the book, but assuming that most have not, and, and assuming that most may not know Birsa, uh, I have thought of dividing my presentation in three parts. So I'd give you an overview of what the book looks like, um, the structure of the book, uh, key arguments, uh, sources. Um, and then the, in the second part, um, actually that's the second or the first part, I can speak a bit about why I wrote this book and what, um, led to the making of this project. And then the third part, I'd read excerpts from my last chapter um, that combines the ambition of the project more broadly. Uh, so um, this book began as a project in my MPhil uh, at JNU, where I looked at um, narrative of Adivasi women um, within the policy um, making. So I looked at uh, a peri-urban area in Rachi um, and conflict around land acquisition where several Adivasi women were um, ousted from their property. Uh, and there were several legal clauses that were used in order to render them landless. Uh, while I was undertaking this um, extensive field work in Rachi, I got interested in why uh, these women specifically would use um, one phrase, which was Birsaka Akrosh, uh, the um, more like a metaphor, uh, uh, the anger of, um, maybe that's a bad translation, but the spirit of Bessa. And I thought to myself, um, it's, it's really um, unfair if I take it for granted and just write a 
flat and dry account of uh, land acquisition and not mainstream narrative that constitute an argument in itself. So I decided to draw uh, a work entirely on looking at metaphorical mobility of this as a figure across Jharkhand in different movement, but also to resolve or at least address the tension between history and memory. Um, just to just for the background of study, there's a view of literature on memory studies even within India. So there's a lot of work, great work by Gyanendra Pandey, Veena Das on partition. But often literature on memory studies tend to focus heavily on events. Uh, and I wanted to trace everyday mobility of memory, which meant that I wanted to move away from event to act. And in that process, um, Professor Banerjee's book was very useful, The Politics of Time, in shaping some of the formative idea. So I look at um, different forms of mobility of memory, not one kind of eventful memory. So the book, the structure of the book is split in three parts. But before that, um, I've also had an ethical commitment in working with uh, or alongside some of the Adivasi scholar who've been coll um, collaborated to the project for a long time. Um, including Gunjal Munda, Abhay Mind, uh, and some of the civil society members who are based in Rachi. Um, so the, I would begin with the cover. So the cover of the book is, uh, of course, uh, a painting by Hasinder Lakha, who is an Adivasi artist. Um, and I've known him for many years. Um, while during my PhD, um, I had thought of uh, writing a book. And if it were to be written, then I would have a cover by an Adivasi artist who were to understand my project. So through a long um, process of conversation with Hasinder, he actually uh, painted this painting, which is divided in two equal. Um, while one part of the painting looks at the colonization, which is symbolized by the red cover. Um, and, um, and you can see an Adivasi figure and, and that's not singular. So it's not only Birsa, but many, ordinary Adivasi who fought against British Empire. And then the second half is about the internal colonial logic that remains. And the neon is the Jharkhand. And all of this conflict is set in the background of memory, which are the Sasindri, the burial stones. Um, so I think as much as I wrote this book, there's so much um, kindness that people have provided on the field uh, for me in order to tell this story. Now, the structure of book is that it's divided in two uh, parts. So the first part of the book looks at historical memory of the movement. So I examine um, records of late 19th century. And specifically, I looked at uh, uh, four cluster of research um, archives. So one was um, based in British Library in London, one at CMS, which is the Christian Mission Society um, archive at University of Birmingham. <laughs> and then the state archive in Jharkhand. And I examine and set out um, the rebellion that was led by Birsa in the background of broader agrarian distress. And, and I use the framework of cultural imperialism, especially to explain some of the things that missionaries did. And I would explain more of it when we get to the discussion, but I try and show how in contemporary Jharkhand, um, the consolidated form of hate against specific kind of minority often lump them together as one group. So in the historical chapter, I show how different missionary group, ghost nurse, Roman Catholics, came with different intentions and goals, and each one performed specific political function, right? So there's a huge involvement of ghost nurse, for example, in assisting Adivasis to file cases in the court in order to secure their land rights. So I try and move away from this idea of conversion as the only trope of explaining Birsa movement, but rather showing muddied past, um, which is not very uh, black and white. And then I take that reserve of knowledge from archival resource and I move on to ethnographic memory. So I conducted fieldwork um, since 2015 for my MPhil, but I continued doing on for my PhD and I specifically worked in Khuti district um, in Rachi within which I worked in two specific village. One is Ulihatu where Birsa was born and then uh, Selraka where Dombari Buru is located. Now there's a broader framework within memory study by Pio, um, by Pierre Nora on, on Liyakti Memoir, the sites of memory. 
and I wanted to use I wanted to use different sites of memory in order to see if they um, they correspond with each other in the larger scheme of writing about historical figure. So the first part of the book then uh, explains the history, and then second part move on to three different chapters. So I look at statues as an extension of affective policy uh, politics. So I try and show and I examine dominant forms of representation of Birsa uh, in wider public aesthetic model, right? So I examine uh, different statues that are installed across Jharkhand, it's specifically in Rachi, but also in Kuti, and try to explain and show in the, um, in the book how there are varied narrative around construction of statues. So as against the official narrative, which is um, tied to, and I have an extensive um, interview and description about um, an MLA, Sudesh Mehto, um, and his idea of building this grand statue um, in an area that is, you know, uh, completely um, soaked in poverty and, and rising militancy and what that might mean to have that statue in that area. Um, and through that, I try and show how um, how official memory about Birsa is created. And in that process, I trace where the statue was built, who was the designer, who was the sculptor, what sculptor thought about Birsa's body, and then try and show how the dominant understanding of affective politics, which is seeped in these aesthetic um, um, you know, representation. So a statue, for instance, is the most aesthetic representation of Birsa, at least within the state, often do not correspond with what might an Adivasi look like. At worst, it looks like a Rajput warrior. And I show how these sort of contrasting ideas about Adivasi, uh, even, even the most you know, bodily attributes come to constitute what it means uh, to be talking and speaking about Adivasi politics. And as against this official narrative, I take some of these findings to these villages where I was based for many months and ask these questions to um, different Adivasi activists who are engaged in the process of um, land rights litigation and, and are often charged with all kinds of um, cases to stall that process. Um, then I move on to look at uh, memorials, the making of main memorial of Birsa in, this, in the city of Rachi um, and how that process is complicated, um, both at the municipal level in the way investment was done but also in the way Adivasi worldview. So I go back and forth, there's this strange kind of tension. I'm not a historian, but there's a strange tension in the text that I go back to some of the archival research and then contrast it often with my ethnographic finding um, to show how, or at least broadly how memory works in a continuum uh, to show traces of memory in the way Adivasi um, commemorate um, the past as against the state that's invested in this grand scale uh, project. And the last chapter of the book, um, it was incidental to the project. I was in Jharkhand in Kuti at a time when Pathalgiri um, uh, really rose up um, in, in a very violent form ultimately. But I thought to myself that there has to be some reference to the past without which um, this movement would not shape up, or at least there are some some of the key tenets of the Patilgiri mirrored some of the observations uh, uh, from the past. So, for instance, T. S. Macpherson, who did this extensive survey in late nineteenth century and created this deed of records uh, for Chota Nagpur, has these really starking observation about how Adivasis were carrying burial stones all the way from Koti to Calcutta. To, to using that as a form of evidence to claim territorial belonging. So I wanted to see if that's, why, why is it that in 2018, 19, Adivasi would choose only a burial stone to inscribe the most modern document of India, which is the Indian constitution that safeguards interest and secure land rights. So what I will do now is to read some of the uh, description from the last chapter, if I may. Um, and then maybe summarize the broader argument and then we can have a discussion. So this is from the last chapter of, um, of the book, um, which looks at um, Bissa movement more broadly, but try and um, make a case about how um, there are these fragmented forms of 
memory that exist well within the community. So we often lump memory as a singular form of past um, and associate that to one community. So within Adivasi community, there are these different groups, subgroups that have very specific idea of belonging and identifying with Pirsamunda. So in this chapter, I trace, uh, trace that journey. Um, and the section is called Flickering Hope at the Margin, Birsites Forgotten Tales of Rebellion and the State. So Birsites are those who follow uh, Birsaism uh, during one period in his lifetime, uh, towards the end of, I think, 19th century, was when he was driven to the idea of Vaishnavism and influenced by a leader called Anand um, Panre, who is now referred to as Pande. Um, and he was the leader of a very huge um, agitation called Sardari Agitation, which was an agrarian movement. Um, and in that period, Bissa was uh, influenced by some of the tenets of Vaishnavism. Uh, Sumbari, who's, who was in her 50, says, and I quote her, we survive with the memory of Birsa Munda. We do not have anything to lose. We do not sing, we do not dance. We, we are not ordinary Adivasi. And I want you to bear in mind that she's saying we're not ordinary Adivasi. We are besides Adivasi, those who do not eat non-vegetarian or drink Harya, which is a rice beer. We have very strict ways of living. Memory of Birsa makes us survive, unquote. After having met a few bedsides after a long day function held in Ulihatu in Khuti, marked by a huge procession chanting and singing on Birsa's what we call now as Martyr Day, 9th June, I gathered some information to meet more bedsides, those who follow Birsa. Having now spent months in Jharkhand for field research fraught with unexpected turns of event, ranging from political vis visits in Ulihatu to Pathalgiri, I was beginning to feel the significance of Birsa, who was at once remain an empty signifier for the state to manipulate in their own color of politics, while also working as a unifying force across resistance movement. Memory, as for this research, I'm aware can never be about one thing. Later on 12th June, a collaborator and I in Charid, which is a small village in Khuti, a village divided in two tolas in units, in one of our first visit to house in Chotka Tola, which is a smaller unit, we were received by Sombari. Fresh grains had been spread out and left to dry under the sun on a veranda, while corner of the veranda was circled by Tulsi, the holy basil plant. Sombari, perhaps in her 50s, had a piercing eye with a cotton white sari draped around her body as she slowly chanted hymns about Birsa. As she spoke, there was a constant attempt to self-identify as Birsaid Sadivasi. Tempted by my question about environment, as we are taught in universities here, land, spirit, and memory, as I sat down opposite to the door, uh, one room clay house opened to another. She said, and I quote, we think God exists in everything, forest, wind, water. God resides in this environment, which is within the forest and the water. We get together every Thursday at my house and worship our Birsa. We chant to remember Birsa Munda. We do not have his ideals, we do not do Dan Dakshina, the religious charity. We have his memory, unquote. Sombari described her worldview as an omnipresent force that exists in environment, that is forest, wind, and water. Assuring me of her belief, she invited us for a chanting session the following month. We sat down for a few hours, mostly rambling through description of her everyday life as a bit sight. As soon as we left to find another person, she screamed at us. By then, I would have aged in that tola for over eight months. And she said, I don't consider you Diku. Now, Diku is a term historically used against outsider um, and, is, and contains negative connotation. Come back for chanting. We'll do it again. In that moment, having spent months in region, I felt strong, deep-rooted, almost jostling rush of close acceptance. But I was also disheartened to find no other besides family nearby. However, we heard another man at a distance calling to us. Uh, Basu Pahan, and all the names are changed, of course, uh, an old man in his late 60s, identifies himself as one of the true Birsaids. He offered us a seat on his veranda, strewn with dry forage and jackfruit leaves. As we settled down, he began to give an illustrative description of his heritage. Not only did his face beam with a sense of pride, but his voice became more joyful. 
he said that the true identity of Birsite is symbolized by a flag hoisted at their house. He said, look around, I have a flag hoisted right at the top of my mud house. I turned around and saw a tricolor Indian flag. Seen from afar, it looked somewhat unusual. I asked him why it looked different. He calmly told me that he has not cleaned it in a long while. Meanwhile, his son, Neil, joined the conversation. Neil was asked by his father to show us a document that establishes everything, as he claims, about Birsaism. Reflecting on his identity and idea of being native to the region, Neil explained that he has a range of documents supplemented by memory to trace and establish his heritage in Charadgaon in Khuti district. The impression of Pathalgiri, which is a movement ongoing in the region at the same time, had generated grief great level of suspicion, defined by the need to constantly have proof, was looming large in our conversation. The legal battles are deeply rooted in cause of historical tension in this region, which I show in the chapter two, and goes back to British Raj, which was defined by a pervasive legalism and an abiding concern that colonial rule can be formally embedded in the rule of law. Claiming that khatiyans, which are basically records, bear his name, he insisted that we look at some of the more material that establishes him as a native in his community, more than just an Adivasi. Khatiyans uh, play a vital role in ascertaining historical records for the native claims. Macpherson, T.S. Macpherson, in his survey of land rights in Porhat district, underlines the primacy of Khatiyan in establishing the Khut Khati right, which are granted to Mundas especially. He says, and I quote, as to the method employed in recording Mundari, Mundar Hootkati, all whose names have appeared in the Khatiyans are named in the rights of records. The Mundari Khootkhatidar must be in possession of land in the village. No attempt could be made to indicate that the actual ancestral land, in many cases, claims to be recorded were made by landless bhuyas, unquote. unquote. Now, these historical bearings remain very significant, even as I write this. Meanwhile, Neil, the son, rushed out of the room with a document in his hand. He said, you see this document? It lays out foundation for Birsaism. It's a very old document. We remember Birsa through this. It makes us who we are and how we live, unquote. The 23-page long document outlined interesting description of Birsa Munda and his life. There were two prominent key features in the document. First. It did not situate the role of Adivasiness as we see now across India and especially within Jharkhand in the movements laying claims about land rights and, and access to forest. In fact, it foreclosed any possibility to recognize Bessa as an Adivasi at all. Outlining characteristics in so far, it highlights his messianic um, charisma. So there are these different, in a very short span time of 25 years, Bessa have had different characterization uh, in different historical writing. It took up many various uh, facets uh, as the movement progressed. Second, although inconsistent with historical facts, such as the description of his movement, the document emphasized the role of Birsa in shaping the nation. Now, Janda formed an interesting part. For instance, the flag has three colors with no uh, chakra in it, as pointed out by Bosu. He says the slogan that follows, and it's written in the text of the document that was provided, Gai Mata Ki Jai, Governor Sarkar Ki Jai, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru Ki Jai. Long live the goddess cow, long live the governor, long live the Nehru. Interestingly, it claimed that Gandhi was a reincarnation of Birsa Munda, a popular impression found in Tana Bhagat, a group which preaches that the, and I quote uh, Sangeeta's, Sangeeta Das Gupta's great work, the Urao religion should be freed from evils like ghost finding and exorcism, belief in both spirit and animal sacrifice and drinking, unquote. Now, the nationalist sentiment in the representation of Birtha, Birsa, both among Birsites and in the memorialization process by the state, is invariably dominant. Two factors drive this kind of identification with nation. First is an absence of substantial historical record to establish the political ideology of the movement. So we cannot ascertain, and this is a not great body of work, but Kumar Suresh Singh's work is magisterial when it comes to Birsa Munda. But after that have number of people who've responded to it, including Uday Chandra, who makes a claim about Birsa movement being neither uh, uh, proto-nationalist or anti-colonial. 
to Al Pasha, who takes the movement to the ground and shows um, the the mending together of religion and and uh, and the politics and what she calls sacral polity. But there hasn't been any comprehensive work that extend um, and advances the work that Kumar Suresh Singh has done in order to trace the impression of memory among Adivasi across the state. So the so the second dominant um, theme within this process was that it reflects an effort to frame Birsa as an anti-colonial icon who is politically frozen upon whom to direct historical emotion and struggle, including rebellion against the Zamindar. The valorization of Birsa saved them, these Birsites, from being charged as anti-national. This is also evident when Basu mentioned his friend in a nearby village who was not troubled during the police raid regarding the Pathalgiri case. In fact, the Birsite family had had a hand pump installed in their courtyard as part of the government scheme. This was because they had hoisted the flag at their house and have a document that claims heritage. Besides, these documents also perform mnemonic and political function. It is mnemonic because it embodies a certain kind of concrete traces of the past, which is very instrumental in forming consensual notion about the past. They also define memory in itself. While inconsistent with historical fact, the document nonetheless organizes besides life for, for now. It effectively grants them a place in the nationalist past, which offers a refuge in troubled times. They negotiate with the state through these symbolic acts, flag, document, and narrative, which in turn allow them to be represented in the imagined community of the nationalist past. So memory then through commemorative practices plays a significant role here by dovetailing the aspiration of nationalism to regional history that are far more plural and diffused. Now, there are several strand on which there are different inconsistencies uh, that you can find between the historical record and claims made by subgroups within Adivasi, but each one of them were done in order to make sure that the land violations do not occur. Um, so Birsites have historically mobilized their political ambition under the religious canopy. In other words, religion is not neatly um, distinct from the political. It is indeed the sacral polity, as Alpa Shah puts it, that defines the social structure of Mundas in Chotanagpur. The reflection of such an attitude is evident in the way uh, Hoffman, who's done again, um, when we think of missionaries today, we lump them together, but had it not been for missionaries, we would not have some of the most solid archives that help us reconstruct narratives of the past, at least within the um, Adivasi region. And it's a broader point also just to mention that there is something to be said about difference between Dalit movements and Adivasi movements. So Dalit movements very early on in 19th century had this self-consciousness towards documenting one's own experiences, which perform as an archive against uh, different kinds of um, historical injustice. While Adivasi archive is remains still very thin um, and therefore missionary archive uh, and missionaries as one of the first is, I think Sangeeta Das Gupta says as, as anthropologist, uh, provide a great uh, ammunition in reconstructing um, the past. Um, so the reflection of Hoffman in his, in, his, um, in his account recall, and I quote him, I did not fully recognize the danger of an armed rebellion, although I saw the necessity of laying hands on the man who under the garb of religion had assumed a purely political role of high ambition, unquote. So these religious practices driven by Puritan and political ambition served varied purposes. It, and I quote him again, allowed Birsites to accumulate in their houses any amount of arms during the movement. In that sense, the sacral polity within the Birsite worldview offer a different version of political consciousness. Um, so I'll just read the last section, which is which ties why Birsites perform certain kind of political idea in the public sphere when encountered with uh, people like me who are outsider and have come to un understand the politics. Um, as the day was drawing to the dusk, Bas Basu was very insistent 
to took us to besides family who lived across the farmland where his stola was based we walked through a vast field across the patches of cracked soil an elevated mud bridge divided each field looking across the field we while we walked under the sweltering sun the absence of water was glaringly evident there had been an uproar in jharkhand in 2018 due to the depletion of ground water levels so these are deeply agrarian belt um and most of the houses uh, sustain on um, agriculture here predominantly in agrarian belt adivasi in the remote villages of the state are now suffering the most as we reached another tola we found a cluster of houses with a flag hoisted basu he gathered his friend and we were invited to sit inside the house that had suffered heavy water seepage through the roof during the rain there was a single room for six members to the family to share by this time i had begun to feel more comfortable about asking political question eight members of three different family joined us in this meeting birju took the lead to speak in hindi while um with us while occasionally translating conversation uh, but was frequently interrupted by an elderly woman sitting across the room she found it unusual that we had come to talk about birsa birju made some remarkable observation about birsa he said uh, we are not political people we pray we live in the most minimal condition for human survival unquote i insisted on knowing about his job and income and he replied i'm self employed and i work on the piece of land that belonged to us primarily us as bedside sadivasi upon being asked about the absence of electricity in the house and access to free gas cylinder scheme birju seemed really hesitant while we waited for his reply he turned around to discuss something in mundari with his fellow men over the years i have come to understand that the lack of trust adivasi hold against the outsider when they question about government scheme a series of false charges and regular intimidation lie at the heart of this suspicion bagicha research institute later run by stan somi prepared a comprehensive list of falsely framed adivasi youth and raised questions about serious human rights violation in this area the report showed that the youth um, that of the youth under trial 97% of those who are arrested in con- in connection with maoist militancy and naxalite violence have nothing to do with them 97% aware of this political climate birju chose to respond in evasive ways he insisted in his reply he insisted that his reply might disappoint me he says and i quote i do not have access to electricity and i do not want it it entails complex process of document verification that i cannot undergo unquote furthermore he explained and i quote i spoke with the dealer the contractor and he needs me to have certain kind of documents such as aadhar to access these services i cannot do this if it is an anudan which is free service policy for the poor then it it must be given free they're doing it to make us all make our aadhar unquote unlike basu who holds range of document birju ex- expressed his disagreement with policies demanding identity documents um Kunal Purohit um, who is a who is a journalist has reported that the state has seen 19 um, and in his in his in his commentary on on the access to these schemes in the lack thereof of the aadhar card shows how the state has seen 19 starvation death the highest in any of the indian states since 2015 one district in jharkhand garhwa has seen three deaths in that period on court The report offers the list of nine deceased person who were all invariably denied to ration due to the absence of the aadhar card card this has created panic amongst those who remain suspicious of the proof and identity so then birju's disagreement with the policy such as aadhar is rooted in rather deep suspicion towards any proof of redi- re- residency he said and i quote adivasi moolwasi hai adivasis are the original settlers ideological basis for pathalgiri movement also reflects similar sentiment on some spectrum the ideological differences with machinery of the state said birju are important to understand and i quote him we have information about how much money was allotted to this block it was 1600 crores we have seen it on a friend's phone the contractor is making a fool out of us we cannot be forced to make aadhar or produce any document to access anything i would rather die of starvation than make such a card unquote i insisted he'd explain why he feels so resentful 
for having a national identity that grants him easier access to otherwise various scheme. He said, and I quote, it will require us to declare our land and address. It is not about Aadhaar, other policies such as Indra Avas Yojana that make it compulsory agreement and seek our Khata account details. There are so many rash Rashids, the tickets that are issued by the government. I cannot get this. Um, it needs revenue tickets. If our land is sold, what we, we will do? I'm not sure what it would do to our heritage and us. The only asset that we own is our ancestral land, unquote. This underlines the wariness shows towards Diku, the outsiders. For Birsites, who otherwise display a symbol of nationalism, such as flag, documents establishing their identity, are unfathomable, and affiliation to le leader is incomprehensible. So then, then the identity that is secured through revenue tickets and card allow the state to recognize them as, as native. It gives them primacy to the outsider, the state. I think this is the most primal to the conflict. The village is their kingdom as, a, as was heralded during Bissa time, Abu Adhusum, Abu Araj, my rule, my village, my rule. And it is their rule. People in the region do not recognize or at least are invariably suspicious of institutional structure and tenets of procedural democracy that govern nation outside the boundaries of the Disum, their own village. This is evident in Patilgiri's stories as well. Therefore, a story of politics of memory that mobilizes Birsa Munda exclusively as anti-colonial figure has many various facets. On one level, it is appropriated into mainstream party politics such as Su Sudesh uh, Mehto with um, several historical inconsistency where Birsa becomes significant symbol for nationalism through closed form, a politically laden through memorialization process. Um, however, Birsa's memory also reinvigorated the spirit of Abu Adisum Abu Araj. Both Pathalgiri and Birju displayed the senti later sentiment and are unified in the political ideology folded in this historical anger about Sahib Log and the government. It remains reminiscent of the Sardari Larai, the resistance in a new frame. While Pathalgiri took up a form, violent form of mobilization and emphasized on militant outlook of Birsa, the latter reflects passive form of resistance. But common to both is the ideological force to protect the landscape of memory from Dikus. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rahul. Uh, uh, it's, it's, I mean, one of, I'm, I'm, apart from journalistic uh, writings, this is the first academic writing that uh, I saw about ca trying to capture the Patalgadi movement and placing it in a longer historical, uh, because that was really, really a powerful moment, especially the metaphor of the burial stones with multiple documents, constitution, but, but also uh, documents that were rival, uh, rival documents to the constitution as the, you know, being scripted all over the land. I mean, even metaphorically, it was an immensely powerful moment. So thank you very much for the book and for this talk. Uh, um, I'll just make one small comment uh, and then open it up uh, for uh, discussion. Uh, so I see that much of your uh, the story of mobilizing the figure who may very well be an empty signifier at times of Birsa is deeply tied to the question of Adivasi relationship to land. And in context of, of course, the change in forest rights bills and um, what is that one? Gram Sabha Wala Pesa, Pesa, and uh, of course, uh, tribal uh, land rights bill. Uh, and the story about the question of documents being the real catch in the whole story is something that we have heard. Um, so are we seeing here a distinction between land rights as imagined as ownership of a particular piece of land as opposed to land rights as in fact territorial rights, which is to say that I am not going to show a document that shows my place of residence per se, because in some ways it's not just this plot or this homestead, which is my private property, which I own, but 
I have a territorial claim on the extensive land, uh, which can be commons, but which can also be privately cultivated in terms of rights of use. So are we looking at a com co two rival kinds of imagination of land rights, one of ownership, the other of territoriality? That's something that, uh, I mean, I mean, even the Pathalgadi movement in some senses was, it's as if it's what is being claimed is political territoriality rather than what we know as land rights in terms of property rights. So if you could kind of clarify whether that distinction really plays out or is this not the case? So that's one thought I had. Uh, so yeah, okay, you can respond and then we just open up. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, great question, Pratma Odwith. Um, yeah, I think uh, A, the Pathalgiri was incidental to the project. So for the longest time, I did not know how to make sense of that movement within a project that looks at Birsa Munda, and perhaps it remains unresolved in the text. So I leave it to the readers. But I think to your question, um, the most primal, and that's my personal reading, of the movement, the primal grievance that, uh, at least in the early phase of Pathalgiri movement, and then later speaking with wide network of Adivasi activists and those who lived in the area, gives me a sense of this um, need for shared sovereignty, right? So in, not just, I mean, it's in true violation of PESA, which grants uh, Gram Sabhas to have um, their own local democracy on their own. So I think that conflict was at the heart of uh, um, movement that not allowing Adivasis to not only have land rights, as you rightly pointed, um, that's something that procedurally they might use as a language in the court for litigation. Um, but fundamentally, among ordinary Adivasis who are not probably uh, um, a part of that uh, process in the court, looks at land as, as kind of... Um, heritage and that's not just to heritage as past but as, as something that is more than land in itself and therefore um, any attempt towards um, making them negotiate that territory um, ask a, a question of being whether they're native or not so the fact that they kept saying that we do not need to prove document to say that we are native we are mulvasi uh, in itself was um, quite startling in a way that uh, they recognize the sovereignty of the state on the level of law uh, and wanted that to be um, respected within the PESA uh, in, in that village, but also had a very strong and rooted sense of being uh, native in that area. So in that sense, that, a, that idea of shared sovereignty was very evident in, in the movement, but more broadly within. And I think T.S. Macpherson's um, you know, land survey is such an interesting historical document to look at because it has these extensive observation about how uh, and I think that perhaps has you know compelled me to write the chapter on you know why would an Adivasi choose a burial stone of every other template there is you know uh, and as I was going around uh, there were so many um, slaps that came about in a matter of fortnight you know so places through which I walked had no slaps had several and each uh, were designed very interestingly with some slight idea of political provocation so non-judicial area interesting to provoke administrative members and cause this moral panic um, to Indian official uh, and I think that was done in order to sort of reclaim that Mulvasi sentiment within the region and you see that also coming up now with uh, um, the need for implementation of Khatian 1932 uh, within the state, and that's unresolved, another unresolved tension. And this is, Patalgiri is also in the background when CNTA was amended, right? It was restored within a year after huge protest by people, including, you know, I've extensively quoted Dayamani Barla, who were all in the front line for this. So there's a, there's a constant fear of being looked upon as a suspect, right? And that really makes, uh, that thickens the plot of being Mulbas even more. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. I so, said, okay, the floor is now open to comments, questions. Uh, uh, we'll start with the room uh, and then we'll come to the uh, online comments very soon. Um, 
whoever is online, please put it down for us to see. We'll read it out. Okay, let's while while people are uh, formulating the questions, let me read that. Okay, what is the image of Birsa among non Adivasis living in Jharkhand? Uh, Thank you. Um, interesting question. Um, I was specifically interested in looking at the contrast between Adivasis and non Adivasi in the way they approached Birsa Munda. Um, and in that process, I spoke to a number of people, including some of the progressive activists who are committed to the cause of Adivasi land rights. And there is one key feature that often emerges is everyone has a personalized account of how they look at Birsa Munda. So for instance, I interview and I have huge discussion about this MLA called Sudesh Mehto, um, who was constantly referring to Birsa Munda as some kind of Hindu warrior in the way he narrated his physical outlook uh, in the way he associated Bissamunda rebellion with mainstream movements about land, water and um, air. And it seemed like um, it was in deep contrast with Adivasis, because I think one sort of interesting anecdotal reference just here, that when I was working in Selraka, where Dombari Buru, which is the, uh, which is of a huge historical prominence in the region where um, hundreds of Adivasi, at least in the folk memory, were killed by British officials um, and it, the landscape turned into a bloodbath. Um, and I met with, uh, as I was living there, I met with this one person um, who is an elderly figure in the village and he told me that stop referring to Birsa Munda as some sort of exceptional figure. He's first an Adivasi and then a Munda and then he's Birsa Munda for rest of you. And I thought that sense of equalness, and this was also prominent among, for instance, even Adivasis who live well within Rachi, you know, this kind of self-awareness about um, one among equal, which is not generally you see in the way we, you know, we develop these ethnography about specific person, you know. So this sculptor who built the body of Birsa looked like a, looked like a, I don't know, like a, like a warrior from a Hindu icon. Then I think that's like a major, major uh, difference that you are an Adivasi first, one amongst equal, and then the rest um, in, in a society outside was very different. Yeah, I don't know if I have answered. for uh, everybody's convenience. Uh, could you disaggregate history and memory as registers internal to the Adivasi? You seem to suggest that history is that which is the scale of the national and legal, documented and impersonal, and memory seems affective and resistant. I'm wondering if these are such discrete registers. Uh, I don't think you exactly meant that, but it's an interesting question to further clarify. Uh, thank you for the question. Let me read the other one as well. You can respond together. I live in urban Rachi, and there is a constant cultural conflict between, okay, Christians and Sarna Dharmites. Did you find any such differences in the way that you see Birsa Munda along, the, along religious lines? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Thanks, Vikram, wherever you are. Thanks for the question. Um, um, would you love to you know, disagree? Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't suggest that. I, I think one key difference I hold in my mind, and as I wrote this book, between history and memory was the history often um, function as a linear progression. Uh, you know, you reconstruct past based on different events that logically follows an order. Whereas... I found memory to be personalized accounts of history that were often experienced and transmitted intergenerationally among the community. Uh, and there are different ways in which um, that in moments when it appears, I mean, memory becomes um, very counterintuitive to the method used within historical reconstruction. So I think um, I, I just can't seem to read, but uh, I'm wondering if those are such no, they're not. Um, but memory definitely is uh, seems affective and resistant, definitely, because it it provides um, it provides 
interesting counter narrative um, to the standard ways of speaking and thinking about past. And I think that's definitely something I have made a concerted effort to show in the book by using narrative as a form of description, uh, using different kinds of narrative and staging them, not necessarily in conflict, but in dialogue to show different ways in which history is experienced by people, which in moments become memory. Um, the second is I live in urbanism. The second is the difference between uh, those who are converted to Christianity and those who follow Sarna Dharma and how, how much, I mean, you kind of in some senses uh, made a distinction between the self-consciously um, Birsaites mm -hmm. and non-ordinary non Adivasis. So how important is religious division uh, within the Adivasis? groups there is i mean um especially if you look at the land politics i think uh within the sarna dharm or um there's an organized form of uh, support network that allows for adivasis to make claims mm -hmm. at much easier pace uh um than those but it's it's something that i haven't i don't want to make an irresponsible response so i'd say i haven't studied that but um based on my experiences there are textural differences between those who've converted and those not, and those who are part of mainstream and organized um, organized religion. And especially if you live in urban Ranchi, you know every, um, I grew up partly in Harmu housing colony, which is predominantly uh, used to be an Adivasi area. And you see the coming up of uh, both Sarna as opposed to that, these industrial households uh, owned by um, caste Hindu society. So definitely it give, grants you certain kind of political stake within the state politics if you're from an organized Sarna uh, Dharam committee. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to make more than this commentary because I haven't, I can speak of Birsites as, as one of the subset within the Adivasi who have very different register from Sarnas um, um, who are now becoming more theist and organized uh, as a religion within the state. Okay. Uh, yes. Go. The mic, because others can't hear you if you don't use the mic. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I've not read the whole book, so I'm yet to read the book. Uh, I read the introduction and found, I mean, especially I must congratulate the, the that part on solidarity and that you not being one of the i'm not representing the adi voices was i mean i thought it was very well written that part uh just a question uh to what you were narrating as one of the respondents told you that why they don't want when you ask them that whether uh about aadhaar card and all so i was just wondering i mean does it sounded to me as if the old subaltern studies while a frame where the subaltern is still autonomous of the elite sort of construction sort of is still there where uh, were you suggesting something like that or was it just a phase in the patalgari movement wherein you know many activists and people boycotted the 2019 elections mm -hmm. but then when the state elections happened they mm -hmm. came back i mean they voted in large numbers especially the more mainland the more tribal district voted more mm. i mean so so how that was that transactional that 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 or or are you suggesting no there is there's this autonomous voice wherein processes other processes of say state making or globalization have not entered or they 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 consciously choose yeah. not to i mean enter into those processes yeah yeah in can i respond in no uncertain terms do I want to suggest that uh, they are autonomous outside and somehow um, not integrated to modern institution? I mean, if this was the case, they wouldn't have used provisions from Indian constitution in Pathalgari, right? So that said, I think there are differences also in terms of how Adivasis are internally fragmented, right? There's no one Adivasi group, even within Jharkhand. So Mundas are very strong and have always historically had very strong politically oriented grievances, as opposed to Santhals. And you could see that through records in the way they um, have description of their needs and grievances. Um, um, 
yeah so 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 you i don't want to suggest that um um but it's interesting to see that um that uh, different adivasi groups in these areas use different kinds of political method and remember that i'm a i'm a savarna from outside male who have unlimited access to these fields <laughs> interviewing them at the peak of pathalgiri so i'm a subject of deep suspicion so for anything that makes sure that they are safe they would take up and i thought it's one of those interesting and very smart political method to use and i think in similar ways about bissa munda also as a political maverick you know just in a span of 25 years he went on to become you know it took up vaishnavism left it went to church left it uh, you know just took up whatever political method he could in order to mobilize his community and i think that you can see across spectrum so i mean kunal purohit also uh, talks about this in why is it that exceeding highly high number of adivasis voted for bjp but that's because um there was this service uh, that was being uh, provided for which they received but yeah but i think i think it all of these narratives also um show up in the book because of my own subject position which is deeply rooted in you know extreme privileges and i think part of my um which was initially a frustration to not see scholars refer to who they are and why they are writing this account and just writing on subjects um allows me to make this book more open ended to these questions so thanks for asking that all right other questions comments so if uh, that good thank you i'll i'll have a, i can make a comment while you think for the you know i was if we uh, get away from the 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 political uh argument of discourse uh, the description that you're making which is extremely important and at the heart of the book but for the moment br- let's bracket it and if we spend more time in actually the figural uh dynamic of multiple statues multiple flags and documents and you know the landscape itself the burial stones the forest uh just this this entire configuration of all sorts of dead human and non human actors let me put it like that what does that uh what more does that story tell us than a commentary on state democracy law and people uh, or does it give us a different entry to that question is something that i'm interested in. why it's, it it i ask this is also because of us you know if we, uh, many of you already probably know it so there was this in in the boston commons uh, one uh, sculpture decided to put up a mega statue of martin luther king junior interestingly without the head right now here is this radical symbol of black radical icons thing being put up but there's no face no head it shows his arms and now he, this is a conceptual sculpture and he has certain thoughts in his mind why in this time i mean it this i got reminded when you said that uh, why always name birsa munda his first mm-hmm. and adivasi dele munda then bisna munda so presumably this this sculpture is also making that kind of a pitch uh commemorating a name and a person without the head and the face and this of course leads in america in in the current context to incredible visceral reaction amongst people including people presuming that this sculptor must be white but it turns out that he's not uh and he is himself a black um in other words i'm just saying that what does it mean to have a pop canonical figure such as birsa munda uh as you say represented or sublimated in forms such as the flag or such as statues which looks like rajput warriors when birsa basically becomes chimeral in the way that he was in his own lifetime you know from a christian to a you know a vaishnava to whatever to an adivasi uh, so can we think in this around this question and 
push the question of memory and recognition and vis visuality as at, at the heart of the story. Uh, and if I, I mean, so that's one, one strand that your narrative kind of pushes us to think in. The other thing I'm sure many of us here will be interested, uh, I'm presuming somebody will ask this question uh, eventually, is, you know, in light of your recent work on landforms, rivers, the ecology, uh, would you re-narrate your story in any manner? Or does the political story remain political and the ecological story remains ecological and legal? Uh, while here the legal story is disrupted by the story of politics in the ecological domain to politicize the, the, the river or the forest, one takes recourse to law. Mm. I'm just wondering if there's a tension there or have you thought mm. through, thought further? Yeah, thought, yeah, this is such a great question, Prathama, and I probably don't have a great answer. Um, I think when I was writing the PhD, my supervisor said this of the response to you that a good PhD is a PhD submitted. Um, so I, I thought for the purpose of the project, I would answer only specific questions, which was uh, what are the ways in which people remember their past and then looking at Birsa. But I understand if I understood your question correctly, I think there is this one great uh, warfare uh, unraveling at least in Jharkhand which is on one level very ordinary on another very difficult which is the warfare of worldviews um, so in the way Adivasi look at land um, and I provided um, records where missionaries have illustrated how Adivasi explain the role of spirit in the land and in the water um, so that kind of worldview is in contrast and often translated into all of these constitutional grievances, right? And I think that that translation needs to thicken now because it's not simply about land rights, as you were saying, or right access to forest and et cetera. It's about a worldview that has not been accounted for. And perhaps this, you know, this other worldview, which is part of the liberal framework of democracy, may have to think, rethink of concepts that is used that are used to describe these worldview. So I think that conflict of worldview makes it very difficult. Even as I was writing it, I did not know now that we use non-human and I'm part of a project that looks at non-human in a very uh, extensive way in terms of rivers and forest. I don't really think that an Adivasi would think of a river as a non-human because it's essentially everything as part of their cosmological constellation, everything uh, in the environment co-constitute the spirit that one becomes as an Adivasi. So it's not, it's not as if they are, um, there's a non-human outside, um, but it's the circulation of spirit in the way that the worldview is constructed. So I think in, in that sense, I, I don't have a great answer, but if I were to uh, rewrite or extend my work, which is what I'm doing now, I would consider these, uh, and you know, we're working very closely with, for instance, Maori scholars in, in New Zealand, where I and along with my uh, team member, we did extensive field work. And there are these striking synergies and striking differences. And it's, it's more, more or less similar while in, in the context of New Zealand, the resistance is against the crown and there's an agreement between the crown and, and the Maori. Um, there are these similarity synergies between Adivasi worldview, uh, which is, um, which is, which doesn't operate in, in this binary of, of being different. So there's this phrase in, in Maori worldview, which is, I am the river and the river is me. And it tells you a lot about um, how you can't separate uh, for instance, land from heritage, from memory, to belonging to territorial uh, sovereignty, all of it, you know, interlaced with each other. And I think I haven't addressed that tension in the book. It was beyond, yeah, but, but it's something that I'm thinking through um, a lot these days, for sure. We have another online question, Ramzan. Um, Okay, uh, it's a general question. I think he's, uh, it's about 
identity, um, um, you know, tribal identity, Munda, and other identities in general in, in identity politics in India. Yeah, please. Yeah, Deepu, go ahead. Uh, this, this attempt uh, to replace both one uh, both Adivasi and Mulwasi by simply one Vasi and the politics that's going around that, if you wanted to say something about it. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, what you're asking actually is, is uh, also part of my motivation to write this. Um, that the idea that Adivasis are Vanvasi um, is definitely, at least in Jharkhand, is a foreign idea because the word Adivasi that came out of the Chota Nagpur Council and popularized more aggressively by um, Jaipal Singh Munda when he did the Constituent Assembly President. Um, um, I think it's a question about self-identification and, and who is asked this question. So in most of my respondent in Jharkhand never used the word Vanvasi, for instance. And there was a complete acute sense of awareness about being distant from that kind of argument, right? Because they don't want it to be told as being tenant or claim makers in their own territory. Um, but yeah, I haven't I haven't come across Vanvasi. In fact, as a language, it was quite absent among Adivasis. Um, Yeah. Coming in response to certain other political moves to say that living in the forest is a form of life that is not very different from other forms of life. And in India, you haven't had this idea of the original or the native community, but you only have simply forest dwellers or city dwellers. And this is a BJP argument that's been floating around for a while. So I was wondering if you wanted to respond to that. Clearly, it's coming from the outside. It's not something that they are saying. Hmm. But so organizing a larger national politics around how to address this question. Yeah, I think it's, um, and there's a, yeah, I mean, I don't know where to start, but there's huge discussion like in early 1970s onward, Ghure's work on tribes, for instance, make that kind of effort of bringing back Adivasis into Hindu fold by associating them uh, as Vanvasi. Um, but at least in, Jhar and also in Jharkhand, there are, and Alpasha has shown this, through her meticulous ethnography on Shiv Charcha, which is something I also found was happening at an extensive scale in, in these deforested areas in, 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 um, in Jharkhand where Adivasis are called um, on Fridays to do uh, Shiv Charcha. So there's this gradual uh, appropriation of Adivasis as primarily Vanvasis and therefore Hindu identity. But um, yeah, I, I'm not in a place to make big commentary on, on that question, I would say. Um, but definitely I can speak from what I have heard and I've written, that is uh, Adivasis are Adivasis first uh, and then anything else. And just to add to that, I mean, one of the complicating uh, situation in India is that unlike in Canada or New Zealand or, or in, in settler colonial uh, contexts where indigenous peoples were primarily wiped out, the idea of the first people or the first nation has a very different logic yeah. uh, from in the context here, where, for instance, the earliest, earliest, uh, more earliest modern uh, Dalit assertions have been precisely on the claim of being Adi Dravida or Adis, mm. uh, and the Aryans as later the, the Brahmins as later. Uh, so whether it's, I mean, from Punjab to UP to Tamil Nadu, uh, Dalits have claimed in some senses first people's rights, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And at the same time, uh, tribal movements also came up uh, asking for uh, Adivasi status, which is first indigenous people's rights or native rights, uh, while at the same time they may get killed in the Northeast when they go as uh, indentured labor or whatever, uh, as opposed to uh, uh, populations who call themselves tribes. And neither, I mean, the Nagas will call themselves tribals and they will also claim to be a nation, but they will never use the word Adivasi, right? Yeah, yeah. Because Adivasis are the mainlanders 
uh, who who have come here to take up the labor in jobs. So it's a very complicated map here, uh, where of course the the BJP version of Vanwasi uh, is uh, has come in in the last. It's probably we know of it much more recently, but it's been part of our RSS yeah. work on the ground for a very very long time. The argument that it's forest people and nothing to do with originality to land, as it were. So I think there's something to be pushed there. Uh, but 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 it can also become a critique of uh, the Adivasi mode of self-identification from another angle, which is to say that, you know. And I often think of Jaipal Singh's speech, right? Like it's such a s- interesting source to go back to when he says, I am the Adivasi, the Aboriginal sir. Uh, in the Constituent Assembly and says, I can accept the flag of the nation and then I have my own flag first in within my territory and et cetera. And I think that kind of illustrate how Adivasi becomes such a um, regionally organized identity, right? So I know from studies in Northeast, Adivasi is actually used as a slur against uh, those tea plantation uh, workers who were brought, out, brought down from Jharkhand to Assam and 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 that also primarily also one of the key reasons why Birsa Munda movement happened, this out-migration of Adivasi at the time uh, of late 19th century. Um, so yeah, I totally agree. The question of uh, who an Adivasi is, historically, if you were to define that, becomes more complicated. But politically, it constitutes its own meaning based on regional grievances, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Any other comment at, from any corner? You have been very persuasive. So people have no questions clearly. So then shall we draw this to a close? Thank you very much, Rahul. And thank you everybody for joining. And uh, it was basically us chatting (laughs) in a happy way. Sorry if we talked, I mean, if I talked too much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.